This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. Uh, name and job title, please. Uh, Osman Samuldin. I'm senior editor at ESPN Cricket Info. So the reason I got you on the podcast is recently I was having lunch with Gideon Haig and he was talking about the What's a Macram uh, book. That's some serious something. celebrity name dropping you're doing there, by the way. I was having lunch with Gideon Haig. Well, I mean, well, by having lunch with Gideon Haig, I mean, we were in the press box. We went out the back. Like, oh, it was Ed Baston, <laughs> so it was, a, it was a lovely restaurant. Um, but he was talking about the book. And, I, and, I, and then I thought, I don't know kind of what you had thought of the book. And, you know, you and I could do like a 12-hour podcast on Wazim Akram and his career and his life. And I'm sure one day we will just sit down for ages. And I know we've probably done this in our life already if people had just been around to record it. But yeah. I, I wondered... You wrote something about legacy, so I, I want to get into um, this whole the whole theory a little bit um, to start with. But why do you think Wazim Akram wrote this book and specifically p picked an author who was very, very famous and very, very non-Pakistani? Yeah, I think uh, so. I think he's been wanting to uh, just leave something behind. I think genuinely he wrote in the book as well, and I think that was a genuine emotion that kind of spurred him on. He wanted to leave something behind. For, for his kids, for his family, for Shanera. And, I, you know, he, 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 he talks about the time that he, he took Shanera to Lahore to see his childhood home. And she could kind of see the emotion that it brought up in him. And she was like, you know, you should deal with that. And a way of dealing with that for a famous person is to write about it or, you know, put something out there. In, in, and even for non-famous people like us, we deal with it by writing about stuff like this. But, you know, and I think, so, so I think that was genuine. But I think, I, I do feel like he also felt... You know, he's never spoken about, he's never, ever really spoken about the Qayyum Report, which is like, you know, kind of there in the book. And you, you, for a lot of people, they're like kind of waiting to get to that section where he writes about it. But he's never really publicly spoken about it. He's always held his kind of counsel. He's, he's held his silence. Uh, and, and until he got to writing the book with Gideon, he said that he never even read the report properly. So I think he wanted to kind of genuinely clear the air about it. And I think he, he probably felt that, you know, he's, he's, removed enough from it now uh chronologically he's like you know 20 what is it 24 years down the line from the report coming out or 23 years down the line from it but he's also i think enough of a distance from his playing career that he's established himself now as you know, a post kind of career he's got a post career he, he is this kind of like talking head and big figure still in pakistan cricket he's never amazingly he's never really worked officially for the pcb which is quite brilliant i think but he's managed to kind of, you know, do stuff and, and stay in the limelight and stay relevant in a way. Uh, and, and, and so to, to, to know that there have been barbs thrown at him every now and again about like the stuff that came up in the Kayyum report. So I think he felt like he wanted to write and write this wrong of, of, of the perception that's out there. I, I think he's more, more loved than he thinks he is publicly. Mm -hmm. And I think more people don't, focus on, 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 on the Kayyum report and his, and his name in that. Uh, I don't think as many people do as he thinks they do. But I think that's partly what spurred him on to, to write. And then coming to Gideon, I, I think he probably felt that if he had gotten like a, a, a maybe a Pakistani writer, then, then it would have been... I don't know, I, 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 could, I could understand why he went to somebody who's removed from... Uh, the, the Pakistani context of Wasim Akram and his life and yeah. the Qayyum report. I think there would have been like just, just natural kind of cynicism and bitterness there. And I think he chose in Gideon, he not only chose, you know, a, a great writer, of course, but he also chose somebody who could come at it fresh and come at his career fresh and not with the baggage of like having lived a life of Wasim Akram as the greatest cricketer, you know, Pakistan's known. And I think it came through Shanera, actually. I think she, you know, was, obviously, if you're Australian, you're aware of Gideon Haig. And she had suggested it to him that, you know, why don't you go to Gideon? And, and yeah, you know, I think they had course, friends Gideon. in common. I think, I think, I think told, so. I think, I think yeah. that was the story. But, but even so, like, I mean, it's not like he wouldn't, he wouldn't know, he knows you. Do you know what I mean? And like, he's, uh, he's he knows other people that could have written this book as well. And not so just I, I had, as well. You know, I, I didn't say this, but maybe about in 2014, so I was in Abu Dhabi at the time, and and I don't know if the approach came directly from from Wasim himself, but I I did get an approach through like through some agents and some literary agents and somebody I knew who said, would you be interested in doing it? And 
I think I put the caveat, and I think maybe you know, if if it was from Wasim himself or whatever, but I, th I think the caveat that I put was that you know I want him to be very open about everything, uh, yeah. and I think that maybe that lost the thread at that time. So you know, if it was him, maybe he had approached me in the past, and I'm not 100 percent sure it was him. Maybe it was his agents or whatever people around him who did it. Um, but like I, like I said, I, I can completely see the sense in in him going to Gideon and 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 getting him to kind of do that job. I, I can completely see the sense in that. The uh, generally that's what happens with me. I get an agent or a, you know um, a publisher or someone who says you know we want you to write this book, and I say I'm more than happy to do it. I just want the the athlete to talk about everything, and then uh, that's the last time I ever hear from them. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, the, just the Kyam report, you know, not everyone. It's so long ago now. It, it's funny. I was thinking about this. You wrote about it in the piece that was Im Akram's career is what closer to World War Two than it is to today, or you, you made some Start of the landing career, on yeah, the moon sorry. or whatever it was. Right? It's a long time yeah. ago. It, in many ways and i was also thinking about the fact that like if you watch clips of nasa hussein it looks like you're watching a cricketer from a different generation whereas if you watch clips of wasim akram you still he's so fresh right but the kayan report is very long ago obviously it was the one that was done into match fixing but wasim's role in it is really interesting because he's come out of it cleaner from a public perception than I think other people in that report what was. But part of that was that Kayam basically says, he was my favorite cricketer and I didn't really want to do it. It's a, that must be a weird thing for Wasim Akram to read going back, no matter, I mean, whatever the truth is. And we both have our very strong opinions on what the truth would be. But that must be a really weird thing going back to think that <laughs> there was a huge report into corruption in Pakistani cricket, but not that big because we really love was. Yeah, you know, this was, so this was exactly the thing. And I think I asked Wasim about this on the, we did a podcast like for with him just ahead of the book coming out. And I think I asked him that, you know, you were, you were always, and I always felt this really strongly that a lot of the players, but him as well, were kind of left hanging by that report. And that's no fault of the report. You know, Kayum, Justice Kayum did a really thorough investigation and report, but it was always what was crippling it was the lack of hard evidence. You know, and, and what the the one the some bits of hard evidence that there were were the cassette tapes of conversations that Rashid the Thief had recorded, had been edited by Rashid the Thief to protect some other people, and so they weren't you know they were rightly taken out uh, as, as evidence. They were like, no, we can't rely on these because these are you know tampered with or whatever. So because of that lack of evidence, you you could not really find anybody like a hundred percent guilty other than like the few like Salim Malik. There was other kind of evidence yeah. that was used against him, the newspaper investigations and stuff. But it, it was it was weird for Wasim, I think, and and he touched upon it because it left him dangling in in this place, like you like you rightly say, it was you know that he's implicated many times in that report. He's even been fined for his actions, and he's been said that he can't captain again. And yet he's not one hundred percent guilty, and yet there's space enough to allow his legend to grow. For the genius that he was, you know that that kind of still happened. So it was a weird place for him, and I think I think that weird place is what actually, like I was saying earlier, is probably what prompted him to kind of put things right, you know, and, and say stuff. So when I when I mentioned this to him, he was like, "Look, you know, I, I hadn't even read the report in full until uh, until I, I I I started speaking to Gideon about the book, and it was around that time when Gideon was writing that that bit that he like was seeing." Kind of read the report in full, and he, you know, he doesn't have a high opinion of it, which is completely fine. But you know, he's completely entitled to that. But I think the fact that it left him dangling and and others was what kind of, you know, people latch on to whatever then, and and they take their sides and they just like they they dig in and they're like, right, no, I believe this report says this, and I believe this report says this, and I'm going to stick by it. And there's fools like us who kind of look for the nuance and kind of hang and die on the nuance. And you're like, oh, well, look, you know, life is not black and white. It's full of gray. And this report has perfectly captured that gray in life. And so we go around with conflicted opinions for the rest of our lives. Wasim, of course, has to live with it. And so he, you know, sought to kind of put it right. And, and the other memoir that he had done uh, in 97, I think it was, was right in the middle of it. So he never fully kind of got his distance from addressing it, you know. And so he, he, he rants about it in that first book, in the first memoir, but he never really addresses it in, you know, with respect of hindsight and, and whatever. And he's gone through like a lot in his life since, you know. He's he, losing his wife and stuff, Homa, his first wife. He's gone through a hell of a lot. There was, you know, the cocaine addiction that he talks about. Um, so, yeah, it, it made perfect sense for him to kind of talk about it, but also to put it into the perspective of everything else that he has gone through 
in his life, which is the thing that I liked about that book. He's an interesting cricketer, I think, for, um, you know, for the history of the game. He's a little bit like the Adam Gilchrist of left-arm seamers, right? He's not actually the guy that starts the, the obsession on left-arm seam. You know, Bruce Reed actually comes about before him, right? And Bruce Reed was incredibly yeah, yeah. Um, successful. And Alan Davidson, 50 Alan years Davidson earlier. Uh, as, yeah. yeah, but at the same time, for our generation specifically, that was the left armor we saw, right? There were so many cricket teams who didn't even have left armors, and if they did, it was Alan Mullally, right? We, oh, due respect to Alan Mullally. Um, Brett Schultz was great. I love Brett Schultz, but there weren't many. They were always injured. They disappeared, right? He comes through and he changes everything. That's from a global perspective, right? And, and you know, for me, he, his was the only action I ever really wanted to copy. If I ever bowled seam, I wanted to copy that, you know, without any of the athleticism. Um, but from a Pakistan point of view, he comes in, he's almost the Virat Kohli to Sachin Tendulkar. And it's, mm -hmm. but it's, it, he's, he's Virat Kohli and, and, um, and Imran Khan is Sachin Tendulkar, yeah. right? Like, it, it, the, the, the careers even overlap a little bit, of course, in this case. So you've almost got the, the mentor being there. He becomes such an important part of Pakistan culture in the 90s and early 2000s, doesn't he? Especially as Imran goes off to do weird things in London and, and, and then the hospital and politics and everything else. Like, was it becomes like the dude? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's how, like, you know, the, 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 the really good point there is like the whole Imran thing. When he, when he first came on, Imran not only took him under his wing and kind of anointed him as his successor, the, the rest of the country saw him as that. You know, he was an all-rounder, he could bowl, he could bat a little bit. And, and, and you know, he was a smart-looking guy, good-looking guy, had the hair and everything. And he hung out Great with Imran. Hair. And so... Exactly. And Imran took him under his wing and he was like, you know, you, you, like you, are, you are me now. And so, you know, I think Pakistan fell for that completely. Like they saw him as the successor and so they made him captain when maybe he shouldn't have been captain in, in, in yeah. 92, 93 when he first became captain just after Imran had retired. You know, Javed was still going fairly strong around then and, and it, it was wrong to kind of get rid of Javed and bring in Wasim, and, you know, other guys played a part in that, but he, he, Wasim himself admits that he became captain too early. And so, you know, they, they were trying desperately to make him the next Imran for a long part of his early career. I, I'd say up until like, up until maybe his second stint of captaincy in the mid nineties. And, you know, he's still the last Pakistani captain to win a test in Australia. Um, and, and so until then, people looked at him as, as the next Imran and they were bound to be disappointed because Imran was a different kind of personality, a different kind of character and a different, very much a different kind of leader. But I think from the mid '90s onwards is when people started appreciating Wasim just for the genius that he was. Uh, you know, he went to Australia, he won a Test match there. They lost the series to one, but he won the Test match. Appreciated as the captain, and that's when his bowling actually really started to kind of. Well, it, you know, you, you could argue from the early '90s is really when his bowling started to pick up. But I think the separation with uh, with Wakar Yunus in the reverse swing era. You know, kind of, it, it, it tailed off a little bit and people started realizing that, hey, Wasim is not just a one-trick pony. He's not just reverse swing. You know, Wakar is kind of limited in his range of what he does, but Wasim actually does more stuff. And I think through the late kind of 90s, the appreciation for his art really grew. And, and, and that's when what we now see, you know, this, this kind of global phenomenon of left-arm fast bowling. I think that's when it really started, that it kind of filtered out into the rest of the world that, oh, actually... What he's doing is completely effing unique. And we really haven't seen this at this kind of level and this kind of quality before. You know, the, the deliveries to Rahul Dravid, just the swing, new ball swing. And one of the least appreciated aspects, and, and this is very much a left arm thing, is, is his bouncer. Like he had a mean ass bouncer, man. Like, you know, and this goes, often goes under, underappreciated. But with that angle, with that action, he had a bouncer that was really, really difficult to pick up. And so I, I remember doing this thread on Twitter just of, of clips uh, of bouncers, you know, from, from around the wicket, from over the wicket. And it, like, you can see, like, batters really, really struggling. And, and most of it is just because with such a quick arm and that angle, it's impossible to pick up uh, when, when the ball is so bad. So, so in that time, he just became this kind of, he became this, this is what left arm bowling should be like left arm fast bowling should be like this and that's i think in that kind of mid to late 90s era is when that template was set that any left arm fast bowler who came thereafter was immediately like 
well, is he as good as Wasim? Can he do what Wasim does? Uh, uh, yeah, can he do what Wasim does? And, and that's, that's the impact, I think, that he's left more than anything else. I think it's that impact of Wasim that still, that's his legacy, really, still. More than anything else in his life, in his career, I think his legacy still, as a left-arm fast bowler who did crazy things, uh, as a way for other left-arm fast bowlers to do crazy things, I think that is like the, really the true legacy that he's going to leave behind. Yeah, in some ways, that's almost what, like why he is very similar to Gilchrist in that mm. everyone wanted to have another was in, but most left-arm bowlers basically just bowl in swing, right? And then bowl straight, right? There's, there's very few left-arm um, bowlers who can swing the ball both ways, right? And he could do everything and he could see the ball and he had the bouncer and he had the extra pace. You know, he was absolutely so skillful from that point of view. Um, what do you think... He and I know you did that podcast with him, um, and you, you have obviously read the book, and, and you know him a little bit as well. But what do you think he wants his legacy to be? I think you're right, and, and th there was something you said earlier about him thinking he's more hated or people are more negative mm. about him th than he is. I think that's there's ne I've never read a book um, by a, an athlete that hasn't been like that, right? They always kind of feel that way awesome. that, that it, you know, yeah. you know. But what do you, where do you think he wants to settle in? Because you you mentioned at one stage he's been coach, a fast bowling mentor, a normal mentor. Uh, what else has he been? A commentator, a sports anchor, a host. He had a perfume range, which I didn't know about. Should have been a shampoo range. Um, and obviously, he's quite vocal. On, I mean, he's not vocal, vocal on social media, but occasionally he, he's there and saying things. He, um, I don't know, really. I think, I think he wants to be remembered primarily as just, uh, as just what he was, a great cricketer. I don't think he has like huge ambitions beyond just just ensuring that he wants to be remembered as a great cricketer. Uh, I, I think, of course, he would love to be remembered as an untarnished cricketer. But, you know, that I, I think that's difficult. Like, you, you're not going to be able to wipe that off completely. But I think, you know, if the weight of public opinion will weigh down on the side of that he is just a great cricketer. Like, eventually, maybe people will, like, talk less and less about Kayum the more we kind of move away from it. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the kind of guy that he is as well, he, he's, he's very accessible, very open, very kind of charming kind of guy. He's, he's, he's great company. You know, he is actually mm -hmm. great company. And I think that kind of, it comes through in his public appearances. Um, and I think, yeah, I think above all, he would just like to be remembered without the asterisk, you know, without the asterisk there, that he's a great cricketer, one of the greatest Pakistan has produced, if not the greatest. You know, Imran, Imran used to say, and still does for the longest time, that he's the most naturally gifted cricketer that he had seen in his life. Um, and, and he used his own example because, you know, Imran wasn't naturally gifted himself as much as he was just a hard-working guy who yeah. changed himself into a great cricketer. But, I, I, you know, he always said that. And I think, I think Wasim probably cherishes that, uh, that description more than anything, that he was a great, naturally gifted guy, but one who did work hard and kind of came through on those expectations. And I think he did ultimately. I think his, his bowling record is so great that I think he did come through on those, uh, on, on those, kind of, on, on those predictions uh, of him early on. I, of course, I hate the fact that he ended his test career with just under four tests, four wickets per test. I think it's like 3.98 because he went through like, like the last two tests of his career. I think he, he didn't take enough wickets for him to end up with a four plus, which I think is like a kind of a, you know, a standard for, for great cricketers, especially over such a long career. But he's, he's, he's a great, I think, I think he, he, he wants to come to terms with it uh, and he wants to know that he is great, like I said, without the asterisks at the end. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Imran Khan is still a better cricketer. Um, just because the 80s might be... I think the 80s is the only time anyone for a long period of time had an impact as big as Bradman's. But I don't think... But I don't think that diminishes what you say about Wasim because he was just yeah. so absolutely incredible. And, you know, I sometimes when people... You, you might remember this. It was that common trope on Pakistani Twitter to, you know, when they were slagging off Imran to go, it wasn't even as good as Wasim. Well, a, not being as good as Wasim is still... Yeah. ridiculous it's, right if you're not as good as was kind of still absolutely yeah. you know absolutely incredible but but regardless of that i i think you know he was absolutely um um you know brilliant from that perspective but there's a couple of other things i thought were quite interesting was that you mentioned this and i'd never thought about it before but he doesn't mention his career 
as much as other players, when he, especially when he's commentating. So there's this big thing that, you know, you have to sort of, someone like Darren Goff, it, I think it's very hard for Darren Goff to ever relate to anything unless it's autobiographical. Dean Jones was another one who did this. KP's a little bit like mm. this as well. Um, you know, and there are different commentators that are very like that. And then you've got the other co commentators that almost, they must push away their career at a certain point, right? And, and it really sure. and that's all to do with your personality. You know, the whole thing with Glenn McGrath and Richard Hadley remembering every single yes. dismiss dismissal they've had. Wasim Akram probably doesn't remember a huge percentage of the dismissals he's taken in international cricket. And if you were to show him some, he'd be like, oh, that was good. I, I swear to God, I have... So I, I wanted to speak to him once about that Rahul Dravid ball, you know, the one at Chennai, which, like, you know... The, is, is like seen as the actual ball of the century from that century and not Shane Warren's like break. Like, yeah, I, I want to speak to him about it. And, he, and I swear to God, he like he had to think for at least 10 seconds before he was like, ah, yes, that one. And even then, I wasn't sure that he knew. And I was like, look, I, I've got it here. And I had to show it to him. And he was like, yes, I remember this one now. And he remembered it because he remembers the LBW, the ball, or the two balls before that was denied him. Because he was like, his thinking was like, well, you know, if I'd gotten that LBW, then this ball wouldn't have come. And I was like, are you saying that as a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure. Like, he was, I'm not sure what you're trying to prove here. But he doesn't like, you know, I, I've, I've asked him many times, like, what are your five favorite wickets? And he's like, I've got so many. You think I'm going to remember? And it's one of the endearing things about him. I think it's one of the things I love about him is that he's not hung up and he doesn't break down his deliveries or his favorite wickets or his career, in fact, in any great detail. It's almost like it's come in passing to him that, oh, yeah, I just happen to be this great cricketer and I'm writing a book about it and, you know, here's my life. And you're like, mm. what? You should be, like, much more hung up on your, on, on like, the, the granular details of your career than you are, and he's not. And, and I quite like that about him. Um, it well, it it's feels also, like... If you, yeah, I was just going to say that it's... If you watch him and you watch McGrath and you say that McGrath's the guy that counted every wicket, it makes sense that McGrath's more like the uber accountant, right? Whereas Wazim was more like a painter and it's like he's painted this beautiful picture and then he's forgotten that he's painted it, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't matter to him because in the moment he painted the picture and now he's going to go paint another exactly. picture. And if you, even, if you even go to that thing you were talking about before with you know, the coach, the, the mentoring, the sports anchoring, it, it's kind of, that's how he lives his life, right? Whereas that's not yeah. Richard Hadley and Glenn McGrath and, and they're fantastic. This isn't taken away from them as cricketers, but that's not who not they are. All. They're not in the moment, guys, right? That's not how they live. 100%. His, his, you know, one of the things, uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but his career doesn't weigh heavy on him like it does on other players. And, and that's, not, you know, that, that's, that's a great thing that people remember, like players do remember the careers, intimate detail and stuff, which is fine, absolutely. That, you know, they've done the great things and, and they're completely entitled to remember it. But I kind of like that, he, he wears his career very lightly. Uh, you know, he kind of lets his career and the memories that it makes for people like us just speak for itself. And so, and, and one of the things that I always thought that this, uh, that this kind of ties in with is his run-up. Because he never knew, like, what his run-up was. He was like, yeah, I was like 14 steps or 17. I'm not really sure. And he used to bowl a hell of a lot of no-balls. Like, if they had, like, you know, the no-ball, how they call no-balls now... You're, you're easily looking at maybe 50, 50 wickets taken off his overall, maybe more, maybe I'm being conservative, maybe 50 wickets taken off from the walls. But he used to bowl so many no balls because he was just like, yeah, my run-up, you know, it's 14 steps, 17 tomorrow. And I asked him, I used to ask him, like, what was up with your run-up? Like, why did you never have, like, a set run-up? And he was just like, well, I, I just felt it. Which is, like, a great way of, you know, the, 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 the famous story about Brett Lee, was it Dennis Lilly who told him to like put on a blindfold and run and whenever it feels right, yeah. that is how long your run-up should be? Which is a really structured way of doing it. But Wasim was just like, wow, you know, I feel like I'm walk I've walked back enough and now I want to run in. And I'm going to run in and I'm going to run in off this. And it works. And, you know, it, it yeah, you screwed his I mean, drawing You could see sometimes time. he would run in off like 10 and 12 steps, right? Like, it, it, and we thought, I think as kids, we were like, what a genius tactician. And in his mind, he's just like, oh. <laughs> I've come back far enough. Yeah, it's time to bowl, right? Have I come to 12? Have I come to 14? Ah, uh, whatever. You know, let's split the difference and do it. And, and he would do it. And it, that, it just, for me, it just adds to what he was. But it also is, is also illustrative of the kind of person that he is. Like you say very much, I think he's very much for, you know, the high of that moment. It's great. Move on. Uh, here's my last question for you. We talked about him wanting to have his legacy as not having an asterisk on it, 
right? What do you think his legacy is going to be to cricket? Because that's, you know, you don't get to decide your own legacy. You just live your own life, right? But what do you think it will be? I think he will go down as like, you know, the, the, the greatest left arm fast bowler ever, full stop, no asterisks there, nothing. I think he's, his, his, his career since then, he's rehabilitated himself intentionally or otherwise, or cricket has done it, you know, through commentary gigs and through coaching gigs and stuff. I think he's done it so that he has built up uh, whatever was lost in that time in 99, 2000, whatever was lost, I think he's built that up. I personally feel there's many Pakistanis, by the way, who will completely disagree with me and many non-Pakistanis who will disagree with me. But I think ultimately, what is it? The arc of history bends to justice or whatever is what Obama said, uh, quoted or something. I think the arc of history with Basim Akram will bend to the fact that he is just over and above the greatest left-arm fast bowler and one of the greatest fast bowlers we've seen in the modern age. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that the rehabilitation stuff you talk about is... It is part of it, which is, you know, he. it's a bit like what happened to Gatting and Gooch after the Rebel Tours, right? They they just kept yeah. playing. And at a certain point, if you'd stop playing, that's the last bit of the narrative. But yes. in his case, he's just been there all this. And he's on social media, right? And he also, you know, I don't know him very well. But, at, but occasionally, like I've had chats with him just when we've been in the lunchroom or whatever. Uh, mm. So I started this talking about chats with Gideon Haig. I've moved on to chats with, with the main man himself. But he just show. feels he feels like such an incredibly normal person compared to most cricketers. And yes. I think even if pe even other, other people haven't met him and they don't get that, that warmth of him comes through. And that means he was also a flawed person. And we kind of accept that yes. because occasionally he goes on old man rants on Twitter, right? Like... You know, occasionally he gets really fired up. I remember my first ever conversation with him was me and him in, in, the, in the back of Trent Bridge in that, you know, that weird glassed in dining room in yes. Trent Bridge. And we yes. both happened yes. to be there while play was on and, and Shane Warne was commentating and he said something that was utter nonsense. And without thinking, I just went, oh, that's bullshit. And then I didn't know who the person was who came in behind me. He goes, yes, it was. And he started telling me. And I turned around and it's, and it's Wasim Akram. And we're this slagging Shane Warner for some opinion that we knew that he didn't really have. But it was such a natural moment. And it's, uh, players aren't really like that. Usually, even if they agreed with me slagging off Shane Warne, they'd be a little bit like, you're not, you can't slag off Shane Warne. Who, who are you? Weird dude in a hat that I've never met before, right? So <laughs> he, he, he does have a natural warmth. And I think that has come through. And I think that is probably in the end what, stops him from being the um uh you know the, the the person who is just remembered for the asterisks as you mentioned before you're you're absolutely like 100 percent spot on you you've nailed it on the head he he is and he even says it in the book that he refers to himself as a pendu still pendu being like this village kind of bumpkin who comes to a big city and is you know is going to be eaten alive by the big city he he sees himself and he says in, in the book, I think he says that his friends from those days still refer to him as a Pendu. And, and it, it comes back to him being like this very earthy, very accessible, very normal human being, like you say. You know, you go up, you go up to like somebody like Imran Khan and you feel his aura like straight away. Imran Khan is like, uh, okay, there's like a, there's a halo around him and you can't get past that. He's Imran. Was he Makram? You can go and you can slap him a high five and like, you know, don't like, like you did, just did. You don't know him from Adam. He doesn't know you from Adam, but just like an off Shane Warren, some observation that he made in a press box somewhere. He's very, very warm and accessible and, and, and very normal. So I think that is what has helped his rehabilitation and, and kind of seen him through. And the other cricketing point about it is, I just remembered like recently, watching Mitchell Stark bowl Ollie Pope the other day. How many years are on are we from like the peak of Wasim? Maybe 30 years almost, mm -hmm. 30, 28 years from the peak of Wasim. He was doing that back then, and it's still a very modern thing. Like, left-arm fast bowling is still very much in that image. You know, the first thing I thought of, as soon as I thought of that ball, was like, oh, I was trying to liken it to some Wasim delivery that he had bowled. And I was thinking maybe Michael Slater, he got him in, like, one fabulous one. opening over summer, right? And I was thinking of those kind of deliveries and thinking, yes. And I was thinking to myself that, shit, going back to your point earlier, is that he still looks, like, if you watch him bowl, it still looks like you're watching modern cricket. Because he's yeah. still doing things... He's doing things then that left-arm fast bowlers are still doing now. And I think that actually is, is you know, probably a good way to end it. That, that is the legacy that he was doing back then, what fast bowlers still by and large try and do now. 
and, and when they do it, it still looks absolutely amazing, and it still like makes the world fall in love with them. And you know that's something that seemed kind of, I guess, popularized. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you.